On this channel, we are no strangers to some good old cosmic horror. We love our eldritch space entities, our seas writhing with untold monstrosities, our horrific and forgotten origin stories. It's always fun to stare the ineffable in the face and grapple with our own cosmically minuscule scale, if even just for a moment. There aren't many other genres out there that can make you feel so much like an ant on the pavement, a mote of dust on the wind. It's a unique, almost devastating brand of horror. And yet, every time we make a video about it, we get comments from people just saying outright that it's not scary. Which has always felt weird to me, given the gravity of the material. I mean, this is a genre that wants to upend your entire concept of self, if not your reality, and you somehow find that less scary than this? My first impulse is, of course, just to argue the point, because surely, if they really understood why it was scary, it would be scary to them. But, you know, I don't think that's it. In fact, the more I think about it, the more that sort of indifference really starts to make sense. In fact, I think there's even a point at which Cosmic Horror might go so far beyond scary that it loops back around and becomes almost blissful. Having trouble writing? Well, there's a 14-part video series you can watch for free that I think will really help. It certainly helped me. The Creative Writing Bootcamp, taught by best-selling author Myla Goldberg. Check the description to see how you can get access to it and change how you think about writing forever without spending a dime. A big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and giving us the opportunity to tell you about it. This class has been a special one for me and I feel really lucky to get to share it with you this way. There's a story called The Nameless City by H.P. Lovecraft that does a really great job illustrating how Cosmic Horror works. In fact, we pretty much made a whole video about it last year, but the short version is this. An explorer finds his way into the subterranean ruins of a fabled city so old, its name has been lost to time. The further he goes, the stranger it gets. Architecture unfit for humans, glass coffins with unspeakably strange corpses inside, and finally, in the darkest, deepest reaches of the place, a radiant white void that calls out to him from within a great door. He's drawn toward it as if by a strong wind, and just before he's pulled inside, just as he begins to make out the grotesque faces of the unnameable creatures beyond, the door slams shut and he is plunged, blessedly, back into darkness. I like this example a lot because it doesn't really hide behind a monster. Yes, there are technically monsters within the Radiant Void, but their description is kind of just a malevolent jumble of words, impossible to really fathom or make sense of. If there were more of a discreet monster, like Cthulhu or the Elder Things, it would be easy to mistake the threat they pose to your life as the source of the horror. And yes, I suppose the threat of death is indeed very existential, but it's also obvious. The Nameless City forces us to focus on the deeper elements of cosmic horror, the ways in which it threatens your sanity and your self-concept. The explorer of the Nameless City says of his experience, I must always remember and shiver in the night wind until oblivion, or worse, claims me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing too far beyond the ideas of man to be believed, except in the silent, damnable small hours when one cannot sleep. Even he questions what he experienced, barely able to believe it except when in a dreamy, delirious half-slumber. After an experience like that, how could you ever quite trust your senses again? Wouldn't you have a strange feeling that everything might be a little untrue, less real? And even if you were able to accept it, what would this revelation imply about your place in the cosmos? The fact that there are terrible truths you will never understand, hidden in the deep, dark places, created by intelligences who roamed the earth the ages before man ever came gasping from the sea? It's enough to make you feel like a hapless grain of sand in the desert of deep time. Maybe, or maybe it just doesn't feel like much at all. 
Maybe, to you, this story is tantamount to a spelunker finding a weird thing in a cave and way overreacting to it. Maybe the revelation of the nameless city and its radiant void just don't really mean anything to you, and you have to wonder how people really manage to find a story like this scary. If that's the case, I really can't blame you, because I think there's something going on beneath the surface here, and it really does work on different people in different ways. To me, this isn't actually about cosmic horror at all. It's about the thing that ultimately makes cosmic horror work. That unspeakable, ineffable, glorious, world-shatteringly massive something that manages to obliterate your sanity and your self-concept. In a word, the sublime. That might sound a little strange to you by today's standards. The way you've probably heard sublime used was just to describe something exceedingly good. That meal was sublime, you might hear someone say, or this view is simply sublime. But the term actually has a long history of philosophical thought behind it. It's definitely more than just an adjective. A lot more, actually. It's kind of hard to grasp. How can I put this simply? Imagine this. You're on a small boat in the middle of the ocean. Everywhere you look, in every direction, nothing but waves lapping at the horizon. You don't know exactly how deep the water reaches beneath you, but it might as well be an endless void from where you are, staring at its gently rolling surface. On this sliver of placid gravity between the endlessly open sky and the endlessly yawning water beneath you, the sense is one of overwhelming vastness. You have no choice but to notice just how small you are. It's always somewhere in the back of your mind. Traveling out to sea is both a pleasure and a risk, but you knew that that's part of what makes it worth doing. So here you are, tiny in the vastness of the sea, and then, out of nowhere, as you're admiring the view, a black figure rises up out of the sea beside you, blotting out the sun, casting its great shadow over you. No, not Cthulhu, not Dagon, a whale. A real, living creature larger than any other you've seen in your life, and it's just 30 meters away. Here, in this moment, heart pounding in your chest, boat rocking on the disturbed surface of the water, you feel yourself caught between two extremes. Your brain registers immediately that you might die here, that this creature could end your entire life without even noticing, just by surfacing in the wrong place. At the same time, so close to this impossibly large thing, close enough that you can feel the salt spray of its breach on your face, you somehow feel more alive than ever. That is the experience of the sublime. At least, that's how the 18th century philosopher Edmund Burke used the term. To him, the word meant greatness. It did not, however, mean beauty. In fact, in his writing, he associates it far more with terror than anything else. He says, When danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible. But at certain distances, and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are, beautiful, as we every day experience. You know the whale is a horrific danger to you, that you would be powerless against the force it represents, and at the same time, being able to observe it in all its great vastness from your boat? What an incredible experience, like nothing else in the world. I find this interesting because it sort of paints a spectrum of emotions. On the one hand, we have terror, on the other, we have pleasure, and presumably, between the two, we have something unaffected and neutral. We already get cosmic horror, that's the terror side of this. The whale could end your life without noticing it, you are a grain of sand in the desert of deep time, you are cosmically insignificant and unfit to fathom everything you see. That's one possible reaction to encountering the sublime. Then. Toward the middle of our spectrum, you might feel not a sense of cosmic horror, but a sense of cosmic indifference. So what if you're that vulnerable to this massive sea creature? Why does the scale of your life against the scale of deep time even matter? Who said the cosmos has to care or that you have to understand it? When confronted with the sublime, it isn't unreasonable for your emotions to simply shut off. It might even be a good coping mechanism to prevent you from spiraling off into an existential episode. 
a way to acknowledge, but not succumb to, the sublime. And then we get to the far end of the spectrum. Beyond cosmic horror, beyond cosmic indifference, if you are lucky, you may have the opportunity to experience cosmic bliss. We all know about H.P. Lovecraft and his brand of horror, but while he was working on giving us nightmares, one of his friends was busy exploring a more hopeful side of this fiction. In the story The City of the Singing Flame by Clark Ashton Smith, the famous writer Giles Angarth finds his way into a realm unlike any on Earth. A place carpeted with violet grass, bathed in the glow of a sunless amber sky, and permeated through with music. The music seems to glide on the air itself, beckoning to him. And of course, he follows. In a dreamlike trance, he wanders through a beautiful city of benevolent, statue-like giants, into a vast temple at the city's heart, and at last to the song's source, a fountain of radiant green flame suspended above a pit. And around it are gathered countless visitors like him, improbable creatures of every possible description, pilgrims from who knows what strange dimensions. Enthralled by the music, many of them begin to hurl themselves into the fire. Angarth himself begins to feel the same compulsion and leaves before it can drive him to self-immolation. But before long, the allure of the flame and its beautiful song become too powerful in his mind, and he finds that he can think of little else. He can't even write fiction anymore, which is his entire career. So he returns, but decides to bring his illustrator friend with him this time. And when his friend, confronted by the beauty of the flame and its song, gives in to the compulsion and throws himself into the flame, Angarth soon decides that he wishes for the same rapture. As he describes it, the flaming doom whose brief instant was better than aeons of mortal life. He cannot return home, cannot even make his art anymore. He has witnessed the sublime, bewitching glory of the singing flame and will only be satisfied when he too has joined it. If you think about it, this story is strikingly similar to The Nameless City. An explorer in a strange place finds himself face to face with the sublime. Both the radiant void of the nameless city and the singing flame offer the same dangers. They both threaten the existence of anyone who enters them, the sanity of anyone who observes them, and the self-concept of anyone who experiences them. But you'll notice, the framing is very different. In one of the stories, all of these are indeed interpreted as threats, but in the other, they're interpreted almost as gifts. Instead of existential dread at the prospect of ceasing to exist, the singing flame offers something almost merciful. Dissolution not as death, but as a release from this ongoing existential crisis called life. A beautiful, musical, compassionate exit alongside so many others. It's probably a little hard to wrap your head around because, of course, you want to keep living. Human biology screams against the idea of death, so it's weird to see it made even a little bit… desirable? The book Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer approaches this in a really interesting way. Early in the story, the main character inhales a spore from a strange fungus. As it grows within her, it gradually shifts from being described as an infection to something far stranger. A sort of brightness gradually overtaking her. She can feel herself changing, the person she was gradually receding. And it feels good, like a release from so many of her problems. Near the story's end, a dying character even describes her as, quote, a slow burning flame, a will o' the wisp, floating across the marsh and the dunes, floating and floating, like nothing human, but something free and floating. Just like all those pilgrims in the temple, like Angarth's friend, like Angarth himself in the end, this woman is consumed gone. And it's kind of wonderful for her. Instead of madness at the prospect of one's concept of reality being upended, the singing flame offers liberation from the confines of a hitherto limited and banal existence. In the first book of the Angelarium series by Peter Morbacher, a man ascends into the abstracted, heavenly realm of the divine, where he confronts the world tree. It is all things. Every piece of reality, every life that ever was, is contained within the lines of its bark, 
the twisting of its branches. Anxious about the earthly life he left behind, he tries to see the lives of his mortal family in the bark, but it's overwhelming and he falls into despair. At this, Raziel, the Angel of Mysteries, says to him, Do not seek to understand. Simply stand witness. Just as the flame offers freedom from preconceptions of the value of life and individuality to Angarth, now this man, standing amidst the divine, is offered the opportunity to let go and allow the truth to wash over him, whether he can make sense of it or not. Instead of cosmic insignificance at the prospect of your tiny life against the immensity of all time and existence, the singing flame offers exaltation. The opportunity, if only for a beautiful transitory moment, to be part of the sublime, rather than just its observer. The story In the Hills, the Cities by Clive Barker is perhaps my favorite example of this in fiction. We even did an entire video on it last year. The short version is that, after discovering that an entire town of people has managed to turn itself into a wayward colossus of human bodies, one of the main characters chases the giant down in a frenzy and climbs onto it to become a part of it. Although the giant is doomed to die, and there is no way this character will survive the journey, he feels he has no other choice. Quote, Anything to catch this passing miracle and be a part of it. Better to go with it wherever it was going, serve its purpose, whatever that might be. Better to die with it than live without it. Sounds eerily similar to what Angarth said, doesn't it? How, in the end, he longed for that flaming doom whose brief instant was better than eons of mortal life. So, if you're not afraid of cosmic horror, that's okay. You don't really have to be for it to be effective. Although the sublime is, as Burke said, fundamentally terrifying, that terror can also be the foundation for other powerful emotions. Maybe when you encounter these ineffable things, larger than life, larger than your mind's ability to properly fathom, instead of responding with fear or pushing it out of your brain entirely, you can allow yourself to experience something transcendent. A thrill at the possibility of release, a sudden longing for liberation, a real chance at exaltation. Maybe next time you confront the sublime, instead of cosmic horror, you could be feeling cosmic bliss. Now, of course, the best way to experiment with this would be to try writing a little bit of it yourself. My greatest hope is that at the end of these videos, you come away feeling that spark, the desire to make something up. But writing, even at the best of times, is a really difficult practice to start. It can take years for some authors just to work up the courage to begin. Fortunately, a while back I found something that will absolutely help you. It's a 14-part video series called Creative Writing Bootcamp, and it just it gives you so much to work with if you're a new writer. There are things in here that I wish I'd been told 10 years ago. Things like where ideas come from, how to relate to your characters, how to write conversations, settings, even how to go against the common wisdom and write what you don't know. The series was put together by best-selling author Myla Goldberg, and her enthusiasm and joy as she teaches is absolutely contagious. You will end the series ready to write something. And thanks to our sponsor Skillshare, you can actually watch it for free. I personally would sign up for this course alone, but you'll also get access to thousands of other classes as well. Experts from pretty much every discipline have gathered there to share their knowledge and experience. There are classes on creative writing, illustration, fine art, animation, graphic design, film and video, pretty much anything you can imagine. You can even join in on live classes, connecting with other creatives and teachers while you learn. After talking with them about it, it seems like the people over at Skillshare can really see why we're so excited about this writing class, so they've decided to give you the opportunity to experience it, and any other Skillshare class that catches your interest, for free. This month, the first 500 Tail Foundry fans who join the Skillshare community will get a whole 30 days for free. And along with that, you'll also get 40% off your entire first year. An incredibly good offer, and probably the best way to start on Skillshare. Click the link in the description or the link right at the end of this video to get started. And I would definitely hurry because those slots are going to fill up fast. 
Once you've finished Myla Goldberg's Creative Writing Bootcamp, please come back to tell us the impact it's had on you as a writer. I cannot wait to hear the success stories. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye.